Okay, good morning, everybody. I hope that you've all had uh, some time to relax over the reading week, maybe have Thanksgiving dinner or two. Uh, our guest today is Dr. David Sanfri, a professor in the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. He's also an associate member of the Faculty of Science there and the founding director for the university's Institute for Environmental Learning. His research focuses on science and environmental education with a focus on the study of learning environments. Dr. Zanfleet is well-published and well-traveled, having published numerous articles in international journals and having presented conference papers in over 15 countries spanning across six different continents. In fact, he has conducted research on the provision of teacher development in Canada, Australia, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and Taiwan. Please, everybody, give a warm welcome to our guest today, Dr. David Zanfleet. I must say you nailed my last name too, and that never happens. <laughs> 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 So normally I would like to, I, I would almost like to get to know people in the room. I don't know if that's appropriate, if we could, if we could just do quick introductions. So sure. going around the room, because um, it's really unusual for me to like give lectures or teach in this kind of setting. I, I almost exclusively teach outside and in the field. So this is experimental um, in two ways, like can I actually this <laughs> 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 and uh, second is the, the topic for today is a bit experimental. I haven't done this talk, so you you guys are not giving it. So, yeah. so uh, Xavier Tyson, I'm a professor in the Faculty of Education here and a member of the ADS and, and I teach environmental sustainability education to many of you tomorrow morning. See you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Connor Thompson. I'm a second year student in the Master of Sustainability program. Uh, my research area is off grid housing. So, seeing this being the first transdisciplinary seminar, I made sure to get to St. Catherine's and be here for it. Cool. Thank you for being here. My name is Nolan. I'm a first year in the Master of Sustainability program, and uh, my focus is on sports and the environment. Um, my name is April. I'm first year as well, and my research area is impact <coughs> development and green architecture. Oh. I'm Erica. I'm also a uh, first year in the program, and my um, area of interest is uh, consumer behavior and corporate social responsibility. Cool. Hi, I'm Bridget, uh, also a first year. Uh, and my area of interest is in gender and women. I'm Shelby. Um, easiest way to explain, we'll just say I'm a first year. Um, and I'm more interested in, um, I guess, the role of values and other factors getting people to um, engage with Right, okay. I'm Kayla Jennings. My supervisor is Xavier, so my focus is on community engagement and environmental <laughs> education. Okay, cool. I'm um, Sam Boche, I'm also a first year. Um, my focus is on uh, system based adaptation as well as adaptation of our university. Cool. Hi, I'm Dylan. I'm also in the University of Oregon. My focus is uh, interested in social media. I'm Abby, I'm in the first year as well, and my interest is in the environment. I'm Nick, I'm also in first year, and I'm going to be focusing on sustainable transportation. I'm Pankit, and I'm focusing on climate change adaptation and agriculture. Um, I'm Erin. I'm not in the sustainability design program. Uh, I'm the coordinator in the uh, Environmental Sustainability Resource Center. Yeah. I'm Sharon. I'm the postdoc fellow working with Julia Environmental Sustainability Resource Center, and I'm working with water governance and resilience. <coughs> <laughs> I'm Julia Baird. I'm a uh, professor in the Environmental Sustainability Research Center, and I'm also appointed to the Department of Geography and Tourism Studies. Um, and what Truman said is what I do too. <laughs> uh, I'm Maharaj. I'm, uh, my interest is uh, in conservation and geography information system. Uh, I'm Bonnie, and uh, my also first year, my interest is in marine ecosystem. Right. Awesome. My name is Amanda, I'm the Center of Administrator at ESRC. And you met me already, <laughs> but I want 
know that I'm in my 41st year. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, yeah, I'm cool. I'm just yeah. saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so, so I actually got to meet Marilyn and some of you in this evil house over here, um, which I thought, wow, that's really cool because my metaphor today and, and my talk is about home, right? And so this is the little eye candy. These are all photos I've taken in different places uh, um, of, of different homes, and and so I thought. Well, if I'm trying to talk about transdisciplinary thinking and relate it to, uh, you know, everybody um, as an educational metaphor, well, you know, theoretically everyone has a home um, of some type. And so this becomes maybe kind of a metaphor, but also maybe more, more than a metaphor, maybe actually um, a vehicle to sort of think about education in a transdisciplinary way. So so that is kind of the experiment today to see if this topic can help you relate to what I'll uh, be talking about. So um, I'm going to call this The Ecology Home, which is a cheap ripoff from the book that I shared with uh, many of you. And that first picture was um, from the cover. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about me. Actually, I'm having a kind of an interesting weekend. I spent the weekend in Toronto and I grew up actually just outside of Toronto in a place called Bramalee. Um, I don't know, anyone know where Bramalee is? You know, the first planned subdivision in Canada. That I was part of the B section. So uh, all the streets start with B. So, um, and it's, it's interesting because I grew up there and I, I've like rarely been back actually and uh, I don't recognize the place and you know I'm kind of I met a friend last night um, who I may, maybe see once every 10 years or so and we just like check in I met him when I was three I rode my tricycle around the block and I met him and we've known each other ever since uh, he's an economist so I was telling Xavier it's like normally I wouldn't talk to you but <laughs> because I've known you for 54 years we can we can talk <laughs> Um, and, and I think actually that's kind of the metaphor for like, well, why can't we talk? Well, I'm an ecologist and he's an economist and I'm going to touch on that a little bit too. Um, I trained as a marine biologist, ironically, in Guelph, um, which is just north of here. Um, and I went to BC actually the first time I met a girl in Guelph and she moved to the west coast and I thought, wow, I really love that girl. I should follow her out there. And then I followed her out there and she had a boyfriend and I was like, oh. <laughs> but then I fell in love with BC, which was actually even better. And I was like, um, at the, at the, you know, I went to the beach and like they had these, I don't know, they've got like five arms and they're called sea stars. And you know what? They move. <laughs> but at Guelph, they didn't move. They just smelled like formaldehyde and they were like, <laughs> I was like, wow. So experiential learning became a big part of that. So what am I going to talk about today? This is the abstract that I shared. Here's the abbreviated version. So the ecology of home, basically think of it as a metaphor and maybe think of it as a reality. And I think um, what I'll tend to do, I'm going to call them vignettes, but they'll be like random stories off, off topic maybe but maybe on topic um <clears throat> i've had this kind of weird hobby throughout my academic life of building houses and that's where the idea for this book came from because i was like wow i'm learning way more about life building houses than i am in my academic life and so this attempt to sort of merge my academic life with my life of building houses and sort of trying to build a home is what this talk will be about. And we'll see if that works. <clears throat> so this is a home. I remember when I saw this, actually, we were, uh, the, the UN University was having a meeting in Kenya and I, I was there to accept some award on behalf of our institute, and I thought, oh, well, I have to go to Kenya. So 
well, I want to do something fun and interesting. And so a friend of mine said, well, you should do a safari. And I was like, well, that seems kind of like, and I ended up, I, I did do that. But um, when I was at this safari place, I got the opportunity to go and visit an authentic Maasai village. And um, so this was a Maasai house. And I remember the fellow whose house this was, he was so excited uh, to share his house with me. And like, it really is like dirt and sticks. And when we went in, um, he showed me where he slept and where he cooked. And he had this like amazing pride in our, uh, uh, about this home. And I thought, wow, that's something that, you know, even though my house in Canada looks very different than this house, um, we, we share this kind of love of our home and, and why. Um, and I don't know if you know about where the Maasai live, but they're like surrounded by lions and they, they, they build these little villages and then they basically build a fence of thorns that are around to keep the lions out. Um, and so this is like kind of a place of sanctuary as well as safety. Um, and they were still living like that authentically. But then I thought, well, there's the lock, right? Like this little modern brass lock, like that also might be something that we have in common. Um, so that got me thinking about this notion of home, how that might be a powerful metaphor to start thinking about maybe interdisciplinary thinking. <clears throat> So, like we use the, you know, like a home run, home base, uh, bring an idea home. Like we use the word a lot without really thinking about it. Um, so it's an idea, um, as elusive as it's universal, it's kind of mysterious. And when I was looking at that Maasai home, I was like, there's so much I understand about this, but there's so much that I don't understand about this as well. Um, so, it's a state of mind, it's physical, it's spiritual, it's definitely where we live. Um, and this mysterious part, so um, I just wanted to kind of share that as a way forward into this talk. Now, interestingly, my first degree was in marine ecology, and I learned this in a book that ecology comes from oikology, right? And you probably know that. In terms of the oikos, and, and oikos in the, the ancient Greek language means home. And I knew that there were at least two eco words that I was familiar with, but um, through this research, I became familiar with the third. So what, ecology. In the Greek sense, this was the study or management of a household's physical resources. So kind of like the study of the home is ecology. And if you think about home, it could be physically your home, but it could be your community, or it could be like the biotic community. You could think of home in all those senses. And um, that's like textbook ecology, right? The study of the home, like how do animals live? What do they need? What resources do they need? Well, the exact same root exists for the term economy. And that was the management of a household's financial resources. Um, and you know, the root of that, like even in high school curriculum, people learn about home economics in high school. Now that kind of home economics has a different meaning than we hear about in the media about the economy and so on. But the original root was about economizing, right? Like being conservative with our resources and using only what we needed and, you know, managing them carefully. And when you really think about that, those two things, when you're talking about an economy like that, before we kind of lost sight of, you know, the, we have rampant consumerism now, but before that happened, 
you know, and that's one of the things about language is the meanings of words change. So, but the original meaning of economy was quite congruent with ecology. They were like flip sides. So my little awkward conversation with my economist friend last night, it's like if we were having that conversation, you know, a few thousand years ago, it wouldn't have been awkward, right? Like, but the meanings have changed. Now the three, the third eco word um, comes from, and you may have heard this term. I ha I was not very familiar with this term, and I still remember. I was like playing with this framework, which I'll share. And I was like, I'm pretty sure there had to be like a third eco word. And I kind of found this because it's Latinized and it's really from the same root. And this is talking about moral, ethical, and spiritual resources. So that's sort of the, spirit, the spiritual element of hope. Um, and that word lives on in geography. For one, we have the ecumeny. And if you look that up, ecumeny is the inhabited earth, right? The part of earth that is habitable. So it kind of relates to whether the conditions are suitable for life to be in that part of the area. Um, and then the other place that you'll come across that term is e ecumenical, right? And so ecumenical, there are ecumenical Christians and they are ecumenical Buddhists, for example. There's two, I'm married to a Buddhist, so I'm learning all this stuff. And, and for example, in Thailand and Sri Lanka, my wife's Sri Lankan, there's one type of uh, Buddhism that's practiced, but then in Japan and in Korea and China, there's another kind of Buddhist. And an ecumenical Buddhist is one that's accepting of all the branches of that religion. And an ecumenical Christian would be somebody who's like, you know, it doesn't really um, matter about our differences. We're like trying to create the big house, right? So the big house of all values, we're accepting of all values under this house. And it, it fits also well with a lot of First Nations spiritual uh, versions or, or viewpoints of the world. <clears throat> so there's three eco words that I'm gonna come back to, uh, probably each with a story to make some more sense of them. Oop, something is happening here. There we go. There. Um, this, this is actually, I don't think this is funny, even though Bill Bryson said this. Do you, have you ever read any of Bill Bryson's work? He's a humorist, but uh, he said, houses are amazingly complex repositories. What I found is that whatever happens in the world, whatever is discovered or created or bitterly fought over, eventually ends up in one way or another in your house. Houses aren't refuges from history. They are where history ends up. They're also a place where your values are most clearly laid out. Like when you're at home, the kind of things that you, you know, put out on the mantelpiece or the, the kind of furniture that you have or whether it's messy or not messy, all these things kind of say a lot about you. So I guess the point I'm making is on one level, you could say, well, a house is a home whatever, I kind of get that. Um, like the real estate version is view, view of a home is fairly superficial, commodified. But if you pay attention and you look a little bit deeper, the notion of a house is actually quite complex. So let's go there. But first, I have to tell you, I'm a scientist um, and I, I kind of joke about, it's not really a joke, but you know, this is sort of refers to uh, transdisciplinary thinking. When I was in high school, I thought, wow, my best subject was English. And I used to write poetry. And I thought, wow, so I could be a writer or I could be a scientist. So my high school self thought, you know what? I'll be a scientist and I'll write poetry on the weekends because that'll be easier rather than being a poet during the weekend doing scientific lab experiments on the weekend. That seems more reasonable. But what I found was my training as a scientist extinguished 
my identity as an artist, right? Like it was really actually the beginning of the disciplinary kind of curse that you become the scientist and then you become disabled in these other areas. So I'm going to share a poem with you, which is very unscientific. But the, the poem is actually, it was from the book, and I wrote it for my wife, but it actually has the framework embedded in the poem. And then I'll give you the scientific version. So I'll read this. To rediscover home, but what would that mean? Concepts Asian and new, though not clearly seen. Household can be home, so sheltered and clean. A managed economy, though not always green. Then ecology of home, this deepens the scene. Relations in place and things in between. To inhabit this home, a true ecumene, life and love safely inside a future serene. So I wrote this for my wife when uh, we moved into our new home about five years ago. Um, and uh, I will tell that story as the third story in this. And, and now I know what um, poetic license means because that's not a word, ecumene. Um, so, but you po for a poem, you can just call it what you want. Ecumeny or ecumen uh, is the term. So, what does a framework look like for this? And I, I love metaphors. So, I do a lot of work in Indonesia, and there's a group of uh, people there called the Bajo people. They're kind of they're they're kind of euphemistically called sea gypsies. And they fish, they, they um, smoke a lot of tuna. There's like skipjack tuna. And they fish for that on a line. And they'll go out for days on end on, in a structure like this. And he's building this, but basically that would be kind of like a floating home. And he might spend, the fishermen might spend like maybe 10 days out there fishing and then come back in with a, with a catch. Um, and that culture, they even like they when the when the when they bear children, the children are born into the water. So they have this like kind of connection with the ocean that's I think very spiritual. And so when I saw this, I thought, wow, this is kind of like literally a framework for a home here, because they're building this and they're, you know. They're thinking about their cultural values. They're thinking about how they sustain their families. They're like using local materials. Um, I just like the image. And it literally is a framework, right? I, I love puns as well. Sorry about that. <laughs> the other thing about Indonesia, when you build, you have to be really careful. So, um, so this is a pier that they're building in this particular framework. And, there's amazing coral reef underneath here. So, so when you're aware of what's under the water, like they are, they're quite a bit uh, more careful. So you could just run boats up onto the shore here quite easily, but the reality is when you're in tune with your local surroundings, like the coral reef here, like I, I the first time I went to Indonesia and I, and I dove on a coral reef, I understood why there were so many fatalities that I heard about in Indonesia. And I thought it was because their diving facilities weren't great, but it's actually because what they have underwater is so amazing and so mesmerizing that even experienced divers go and they forget to check how deep they are or how long they've been under the water because they're mesmerized by the diversity of life that they're seeing. So, um, in this particular case, there's always this conflict between um, like having a sustainable economy and then protecting your natural resources. So how you build is very important. So in my work, being an ecologist, boy, this would be like uh, kind of an, a classic textbook sense of how ecology works. And I've used this framework in my research for probably the last 20 years. And I'm going to tell a story about each of these in a second. Um, but the technosphere is really like that relates to our 
human practices on the planet. And it's, um, it's somehow related to the idea of technology, it could be, but it also refers to the word technique. So it's like the way we do things, and sometimes we do things with technology, or sometimes we have specific techniques. Um, and those influence our environment that we exist in quite substantially. The ecosphere, um, of course, our sort of physical ecology. Um, and, you know, even in a room like this, there are ecological factors like the temperature or the humidity or so on that, that influence how, uh, how we perceive the world. And then lastly, and educators know a lot about this, um, the sociosphere, like, right? you know, when, you know, you come in with a group of students, um, every group is different. Every, the interactions between people have a huge impact on what goes on. Um, as a high school teacher, I learned this the hard way because, you know, I used to have like science 10 classes that I taught and I would have this like amazing idea for a lecture and I would, I would do the lesson and it would like go fabulous for this first group that I had. And I was like, wow, that was a good lesson. And then I would try to do the exact same lesson with another group and it wouldn't work at all because it was like, wow, so people are different. That's what you're saying. So every group is different. Um, so that's kind of a way to sort of think about the influences, social, physical, and, you know, in a way, practical. So this is where those eco words map out on this. So, um, and this is kind of a, a new development for me to sort of think of it this way. Um, so I think what I'll do is sort of move to some stories about the deeper meaning of this. So, and I'll come to ecumeny last, but I'll start over here with economy. And there was probably a story that I shared with the group. I don't know if you uh, read the story Lost in the Technosphere, but um, I'll kind of relate to that first. So <clears throat> this is really, um, before I even started at SFU, um, here's a house. I, I remember uh, this house is in an area called Brentwood Bay, which is just north of Victoria. And at the time I was working at, um, it's now called Vancouver Island University, but at the time it was Malaspina College. And I was working as an adult basic educator there, and I was doing some work with the faculty of ed, and I wanted to build a house. I was doing my doctorate, just wrapping it up at the time, and uh, <clears throat> I also was sort of in the process of getting hired by SFU. And the dirty secret at SFU was that I was actually not hired as an environmentalist. I was hired as the managing director of the Center for Educational Technology. I was the tech guy. And uh, I told a little story about that in that writing too. So my wife at the time, now my ex-wife, um, she was from Victoria and really wanted to live there. And housing prices were getting really expensive and we had like found a deal on a lot and while I was doing my doctorate, I came back and I remember thinking, I've always wanted to build a house. And I begged her, I was like, please, I can do this. You know, I, I could build a house for us. And she's like, you're crazy. You're a professor. You don't know anything about houses. And I said, well, what if I took a contractor's course? What if I went to the college and I actually like took their contractor's course for nine months? Then would you let me do it? And she was like, you won't take the course, so sure. And I went and I took the contract because <laughs> I really wanted to build this house. And it was a cool lot because um, the guy that owned the lot before me, he was a forester from BC. So he had planted like one tree from every species all around the lot. It was such a private lot. And there was like, literally you could like, oh, that's a Pacific dogwood. Oh, that's a Western red cedar. There was like one of everything around the house and there were these two beautiful Douglas fir trees there that I loved. And so I was like, okay, I can do this. 
And so I went about sort of the technical process of building a house. And I'll tell you, it's pretty complicated. Right? <laughs> it's, it's like, there's like a sequence of events. I don't know if you, if you know anything about this, but I mean, the first thing is you have to have a design and then you have to have a survey and then you have to get a building um, permit and then you have to get financing. And the bank will only release funds at certain processes and it involves inspections. And so like, I didn't hire someone to build this house. I was like right in the middle of it, talking to the bank, talking to the architect, uh, figuring out how this would all work, like fi finding out like basically you have subcontractors. So the first job was like, I got to find somebody to do the foundation for the house. and. I've got to order concrete and I have to get three bids for this and then this has to be finished and then I'll hire the next guy and so on. Amazingly complex and I went to town on this. I built this house in six months from start to finish on budget um, and partly I'd like to think, wow, I'm just like an amazing manager, um, <laughs> but it was a 40 year low in housing starts in Victoria. So I, I literally had tradesmen coming to my house and stapling their business cards to the house going, can I work for you? Um, and you know, so I built this house and, and I was like, wow, see, see ex-wife. You know, so, no, we were still together then. I'm, like, I'm bleeding into the second story, but uh, but, but I, she was like, "Wow, you did that! I can't believe that." Um, and I was like, "It was a technical success." But then what happened was, as the house and as the landscaping happened, the thing that broke my heart were, was that some of the trees and in fact some of the favorite trees that i had on the lot started dying because of the construction process and where we had put the driveway so um, the two beautiful douglas fir trees that had actually been the reason that i bought the lot they died about two years after this house was finished and then we had to uh, and they were actually protected by covenant so we hadn't uh, we actually had to pay a fine and i was like Oh, and I, and, I was like, and I was like, wow. And like, I'm actually, I wasn't like totally uh, rampant with the development. Like we protected most of the lot, but it kind of shocked me how quickly things turned around and what the impact of building the house was sort of on the natural environment around me. And it really caused me to think. And ironically, <clears throat> I got the job at SFU about exactly the time that I finished this house. So I actually never lived in this house. I built the house and I, I built it for my wife and then we almost split. And then I got the job at SFU and I went over and she said, oh, okay, we'll move to Vancouver. But it took her three years to decide we'd move to Vancouver. And then we sold the house. I saw it a few months ago actually and it's still standing, so <laughs> good job. But I never lived in it, which I thought, you know, beautiful story about like actually for some people, a house is literally a shelter and it's a project and it's like literally you do the renovations and you build it in a certain way. And that was really all there was to that house. And I thought, well, okay. And I could have made some other choices about how I built the house, but in the end, it was literally just a building, and I sold it. Great. So after I built that house, this is many years later. Um, I don't like Vancouver actually very much. I liked Vancouver Island a lot more. It's like more rural. I have two identities actually, and just sort of uh, happened on Bowen Island as well. So Bowen Island is in Howe Sound, it's uh, off Horseshoe Bay. It's a 15 minute ferry ride away from West Vancouver. And I bought a lot there and it was kind of ironic because we were living in West Vancouver and we were renting a place. And my uh, partner at the time had gotten a job as a teacher in West Vancouver. And if I thought Victoria was expensive, West Vancouver was just outrageous. And we were like thinking, 
um, could we ever afford a house here? And so this time, it was her that said to me, well, you built a house. Do you think you could do that again? And I was like, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> and then she was like begging me, like, come on, you have the skills. You did it one time already. Um, why don't we do that on Bowen? And, uh, and we found a lot, and it had like sort of semi-waterfront, and it was like this was actually part of my property. And I would like go swimming there with my kids, and it was an amazing place. And I thought, well, if I do that, I'm going to go eco. I'm going to become like the greenest person you ever saw. Like that's my condition. If we're going to build a house, I don't want to do what I did in Victoria. I want to do everything green. And uh, man, did we ever! So I like I I like to call this growing a home. In fact, at one point I was going to do a book called Growing a Home. And it was going to be about green building. And it felt like every phase of the development from the first part was like, okay, where are we going to put the house? Because there's trees all over the place. And I know what happens when you disturb trees. So let's do the site planning very carefully. And I took out like invasive holly and other things like that. And we put the house in places like that. We actually did another thing for heating we did ground source heat pumps, which uh, was an amazing process and I learned so much about it. Um, we did uh, all, all kinds of uh, <clears throat> local building materials and the most interesting part of that process, like if you look at sustainability principles, is that I used a lot of on-island on contractors. So I used like neighbors and local people to kind of work on the project with me. Um, now, this was interesting because uh, all the things that are good about a small town are also all the things that are bad about a small town. So like, you know, if I were building this house in Vancouver and a contractor ripped me off, I would go up one side of them and down the other and I would be, you know, I would, I would like be uh, Mr. Businessman. But when you live on an island of 2,000 people and your kid is in the class of your contractor's kid, you can't do that. You have to like, you have to deal with conflict in a different way. That was actually the hardest thing because I was like, wow, I'm going to have to like negotiate. So luckily that contractor's course taught me um, and then a logical consequence is kind of guy. I had time clauses on everything. The big problem was there were lots of houses being built in Vancouver and all the island people just thought, oh, I'll get the contract with David. I'll go work there for a week. And then if I get busy, I'll go work in Vancouver. And then, you know, when it slows down, I'll come back and finish David's job. Except David wasn't happy about that, you know, like waiting. So I had time clauses on everything. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, so this one guy, he came in and he started the millwork. And the millwork is like all the moldings around the doors and so on. And there is actually, you know, a clever way to do that. And I learned that by watching him. And, you know, he like came and he spent two days and then he disappeared and I didn't see him for two months. And I was like, oh. So like I fiddled around and I finished it like based on what he taught me on the two days that, you know, and, and so. But the story I really want to tell, and this is kind of a, a feeling or viewness here, um, is that every single decision in that house was a conflict with my ex-wife and I. In fact, this house split us up. Um, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out what was going on because she asked me to build the house um, she knew I was like the environmentalist. I was bringing classes over here when we built, when we put the geothermal in. <clears throat> I had whiteboards. We like laid out, uh, you know, the energy system in the house so that students could come in and understand why, where was this heat coming from? We had a spring, an underwater spring in the house. And it was amazing. But every time that we made a decision, so it would be like, okay, how are we going to heat the house? we could just get electric baseboards that would cost 
$3,000, we could heat the house, except over a longer period of time, it would cost a lot more. Or we could put the geothermal in, that would cost us 15,000, but it would pay for itself within five years. Well, that was an argument that we had. And the whole time I was building the house, I thought, this is our house, we're gonna live here for 20 or 30 years. Why wouldn't we do the sustainable thing? Like, you know, the roof, we were gonna put a roof on, you could put, Asphalt shingle, it's cheap. You could put it on for like $5,000. Or you could put a metal roof on that would cost twice as much but last 50 years. And my wife was like, go with the shingles. And I'm like, I want to go with the metal roof. Like, that's actually the sustainable thing. And when we finished the house, she said, that's great. Now we can sell it. And I was like, what did you do? What, what did you just say? So like I kind of understood now where, where the difference was because I was kind of putting myself into the house and trying to be green. And when you're trying to be green, you got to think long term. And the, the most economical thing is the greenest thing when you think long term. When you think short term, the most economical thing is probably the least green thing. So it's got to do with how you're viewing your commitment to that place, right? So um, that was really hard. Um, I don't mind sharing with you. I put so much of myself into that place that I can't put a picture of the house up and I can't go to Bowen Island anymore either. Like it just is too hard for me. Like, um, and I can't talk to my ex-wife anymore either. So, but you know, there is a happy story. I did get remarried, so yeah. And that's the last story. And th this has actually been the most interesting story for me. And this sort of refers to kind of that. So if you can see the stories I'm sharing are kind of related to the spheres. So this last one um, is the notion, well, I didn't actually build this house, but I kind of am rebuilding it and re-inhabiting inhabiting it. So I, I live now in Chilliwack, which is quite a ways from Bowen Island and quite a ways from Victoria. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure if you know, but there used to be an army base in Chilliwack. And I think in the late 90s or mid 90s, they closed the base and Canada Lands and Housing came in and they said, we're gonna build Canada's first green subdivision. And so, the first 20 or so homes were not new homes, and my home is one of them. It was actually built in 1945 as a PMQ. I joke with my wife about this all the time. I say we, we, leave, we live in a permanent married quarters, so that, that's what PMQ means. Uh, so like permanent married quarters was a term for where the officers would, would live. And so this house, um, I guess in 2005, when they started the subdivision, they took all the wiring and the plumbing out, um, they took all, and they just tore it right down to the studs um, and the foundation, and they rebuilt the house, but they kept the original fur floors and the bedrooms and a lot of things. So um, on paper, it was built in 2005, but in reality, the house was built in 1945, and it's been refurbished with a new system. It had one, um, one bathroom in it, and the smallest bathroom you can imagine. Um, so I, I took it on myself. Well, we're going to like we're going to develop the basement, and now my wife has this uh, hundred square foot spa in the bath in the in the basement that I that I built. Um, and we're using refurbished material. There's a there's a store in Chilliwack called Chilliwack New and Used. And I go in there all the time and I'm like amazed at what people throw away, what people tear out of their houses and think is garbage. And I found 50 year old glass blocks, you know, that we used in the bathroom and uh, with like uh, old barn boards and stuff that we turned into kitchen countertops and things like that. So, um, but, I guess the other part of it is like my wife is Buddhist and um, 
he's got a very different worldview than like a Dutch guy. And, uh, you know, sort of as we've come to like work together and live together, I've got a very different kind of values driven view of the world than I did before. And it kind of fits nicely with a lot of the international work that I'm doing as well. And I would call it ecumenical. I would say like we have so much to learn from other cultures and other value systems. It's quite, our, our Western way of doing things is quite an arrogant one-sided way of thinking about the world. And of course now in Canada, we're talking about, um, you know, decolonizing and really re-inhabiting like communities. And so ecumenical ideas are really about re-inhabiting the place that you live in, really understanding um, the inherent complexity um, of places. So, so a lot of that is First Nations culture, but increasingly it's multiculturalism as well, and realizing that the people in the room haven't had the same experiences that you've had, and they have other stories to tell about how life happens. So, <clears throat> so that was a bit of a rant. Um, Noel Goff, you know, have you ever met? Noel Goff is a, he's a very uh, sort of well polished, published and polished Australian uh, colleague of mine. Um, and he's an environmental educator and he said this in one of his publications. To have a profoundly ecological understanding, we must shift our attention from the objects of environmental education, such as desired states of the environment or changed human attitudes to interrelationships, to the interactions between people and other people that we call teaching. And, and by teaching, I don't mean just in the school system either. I think we're teaching each other all the time, wherever we are. Um, and I think this has actually been one of the biggest problems of the environmental movement is that we're like replicating this idea of the right answer and like looking at, well, if people just did this or, but what we act, actually have to do is like refocus on relationships and refocus on just the inherent complexity of like, cause we oversimplify things. So we could say, oh, I bought a new house, <coughs> but like without really thinking about what that means, like what, you know. Um, and we don't do this naturally. Um, you know, one, one of the things, uh, I'm a very much a place-based educator, and one of the, the questions I like to ask people, like, you know, we all get in our routines, and I, I like to say, you know, um, you know, where you live, your neighbor's house, what color is their roof? And most people can't answer that question, right? And it's like, what, what do you mean you can't answer that question? Is that your house? You walk past it every day. What color is your neighbor's room? Nobody can answer that question because we're in our routines. We're not noticing our homes. We're not noticing place. We're just like doing what we do. The only people that can answer that question are people that have recently moved. If you like, oh, like I moved into a new place and then you're like aware of your surroundings and you're aware of what the relationships are and then at some point you get busy and that shuts off and then you don't notice that anymore uh, and that's really the root of the problem is that sort of disconnecting and getting into the routine again so this is another way this is my other home uh, this is bc um, I had this fascination. There, there's those sea stars I told you about earlier. Um, and, and so because I'm an educator, I'll be chatting with the, your class tomorrow about this. Um, but like taking this concept and sort of thinking about the broader home, the natural world that we live in. Well, coming from Ontario, BC was a shock. Like really the biodiversity, that, I'm not bragging, well maybe a little bit, but we have like amazing uh, biodiversity. We have also have amazing climactic like kind of variation. Like I, I remember growing up in Ontario and it's like, well, you know, what's it like at Guelph? Well, it's the same as it's in Ramalee. It's the same as like the, the, 
the weather patterns are a bit more uniform here. But in BC, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes or drive five miles. It's like different because of the mountains and everything. So we have um, this incredible biodiversity and we also have an incredible cultural diversity. Like we have something like 300 different language groups in BC. So um, it's, a, it's a really good place to argue for place-based education because it can be quite different when you drive just a few kilometers, the, the cultural groups are different and, and so on. So th this framework um, applies itself to educational settings as well. And this drawing was a, a student of mine did I love the expression. He said, we're all trying to build a home. And, and this um, was his uh, representation of the big house in uh, Squamish, which was a First Nations education program. And we would come and uh, camp in the big house and like sleep on the slats and, you know, cook with rocks and things like that there. And uh, I think increasingly uh, First Nations views of um, education and kind of traditional ecological knowledge is becoming really important to this conversation of home. So there's my model reframed, beautiful house, Western house, maybe that's the big house. Um, and with that, you know, we can kind of understand that our ecology is important, our economy is important, but then lastly, this notion of ecumenism and in, in the stories that I told it's like you know yeah I built a house but I killed stuff and then I built another house then I didn't kill green stuff but I killed my relationship and and really if you can like look after all of those things then you're going to have a more holistic view of what it takes to really sustain yourself because you need all those things uh, not just two of them or one of them. <clears throat> so I think that's my talk. Um, and I have lots of time for questions and stuff, right? So, or have I used up the time? <laughs> of our different homes and our own experiences in order to go beyond seeking facts and to challenge ways of thinking every day. Also understanding an ecology of home um, could in turn allow us to rediscover uh, stuff in ourselves and within our communities. So just um, on behalf of the SAS program and the Environmental Sustainability Research Center, we want to thank you for taking the time to come and speak with us. And this is just a small chunk of our gratitude. Thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is not showing. <laughs> this is great. This is great. You can never have too many reusable coffee mugs in my, in my experience. I, I have. Can I tell you? Can I tell another story? Absolutely. Um, so we have this framework in BC. I'll be like sharing that with the group tomorrow. But. Um, this sort of notion of ethics and values. Like I, I live in a place called Chilliwack and Chilliwack is kind of famous for a lot of the wrong reasons. <laughs> like, I don't know if you know, like, but like it's kind of B, uh, BC or Canada's version of the Scopes trial. Like it's very religious community and, uh, you know, teaching evolution in Chilliwack. I think they tried to ban it at one point, like the, the Christian community. And so, and there's me running around telling people, you know, uh, we should really teach with our values in mind and our ethics in mind and other people saying, well, I don't think you can teach ethics or values. And I think you're going to get in trouble, especially in Chilliwack trying to do that. And my comeback is re relates to this story because I try to model I try to model environmentalism in my own life as much as possible. Um, and one of the classic ways is, uh, you know, the reusable. Like since the 80s, every environmentalist knows this is what you have to do. 
So my story is, uh, I was actually, it was the first year of my environmental program at SFU and I'm an avid cyclist. I do triathlons. So Burnaby Mountain is like this, like our university is at the top of a mountain. It's like 500 meters. It's like twice the height of the Niagara Escarpment. Um, so like riding to campus is not trivial. Like, you know, if you, you know, you've got to like train for it. So I was riding from downtown Vancouver and I was riding my bike to campus just about every day in this effort of like walking the talk or modeling sustainability and I was usually pretty good and it got easier over time and then this one day I started getting on my bike and I usually would have my reusable coffee mug and I'd put it in my bike cage. Um, my bike cage broke in the morning and I had to leave my coffee cup at home. And I rode my bike to campus and I got there and I thought, oh, I better have a shower because um, it was like hard work. And then I was like, oh, my class is starting. I have to go get a coffee. Like really, I, I can't function without that. So I went to the coffee shop and I got the classic styrofoam cup they gave to me and I got my coffee in it and I walked to my class. And I think it was the first class because I was like, it was Rose. And, we had, and as soon as I walked in, I could see this woman in the third row. She like physically twitched. <laughs> it was just like, looked at me. And she didn't say anything right away. And everyone was being nice and we're doing introductions. And then after about four minutes, out came the finger and she was pointing at me and she was shaking and she was like, you call yourself an environmental educator and there you are with your cup and she gave me the whole lecture that I've probably given like a million people myself and I was like oh and I was like so defensive and I was trying to explain what happened to the bike cage and, and I was like oh my god and and then I was like oh wait a minute how did you get to campus and she driven so it was like <laughs> moral high ground regained by the instructor. I have a styrofoam cup, but I rode my bike to campus. You drove a carbon spewing machine, but look at your cup. Like, come on, really. <laughs> but I guess the lesson I learned was I didn't realize I was teaching even before I opened my mouth. What I was wearing. Uh, like what I what I do, um, basically, you know. So now, like, uh, I have probably thirty of these because I know I can't do that. And I, like, it's a, it's actually as an educator, I can't do that because. And I tell our student teachers the same. I was like, you know, never be a better teacher than you are a person. People will like call it. They'll know right away that you're modeling your ethic is all over you. Like kids um, that, you, that are becoming like pre-service teachers, I was like, you know, make sure you don't wear the same clothes. And make sure you wash your hair. The kids are looking at you. The kids are noticing. So they're going to notice whether you're doing this or whether you're driving up in a Cadillac or whether you're riding your bike. And so that environmental ethic, um, as an educator, I became really, that was a hard lesson for me to realize, oh, it's not in the curriculum, but it's still there. Yeah, you're teaching all the time your environmental ethics. So. Anyway, another rant. Thank you. So um, we'll take questions from anyone who has questions here. Um, would it be possible to go back to the ecology of home framework? If yeah, you, if you reopen. Yeah, I can. Board. I can. It should. The the spheres? Yes. There. That one? Could be. Still. Oh, it's coming. Yeah. It's perfectly clear here. So <laughs> I'll know what I'm talking about. You'll know what I'm talking about. Oh there hang on. It it I'll i I'll restart it. Is it there? Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Perfect. There we are. Okay, two questions. First, where can I find this to source it? You've just worked your way into my MRC. Um, where, where can I find this though? 
Yeah, well, I can send you a version of that. So if you email, yeah, First, if you yeah. Yeah, was it, was it in, I can't remember if this framework is in the reading that I sent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there's a, there's a, yeah, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, the publishing world, because like I published this book and the publisher I used was Sense Publishers. And they used to allow like free downloads. So like they had like one or two chapters. So I, so I, I recently went back to them for my own grad class and I said, oh, like I use this framework. Can I, can I use that chapter? They said, no. And I was like, wow. Because they got purchased by Brill. Um, so, so I'm like, well, it used to be a free download. And so I actually found it the free download so I have it and I downloaded it when it was legal to, to share so I can share it so okay. even though it's not. That image is in the reading. <laughs> yeah, I'll get for someone. Um, yeah. Okay, next question. Have you given consideration to changing specifically the location of the person? So if this were an actual Venn diagram, I would suspect that in you know, the regular modern home, the person may have more of a connection to the sociosphere and the technosphere and maybe less of a connection to the ecosphere than someone living in a home like yours or living off grid like I'm seeing in my research. So the actual location of those spheres and the person within them. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not entirely happy with the model. So like, because I've actually had that internal part of the model for most of my career, but now I'm realizing that conceptually when I'm putting this this new like the lens of home on it it's it's a little confusing so this is just the perfect situation right. but the real world is not going to be like that right, right. and 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 actually yeah like what what you're saying is that depending on where you are you might be unequally influenced by one sphere or the other and originally when I started doing this work I would say that actually uh, the dominant sphere in most people's lives is the technosphere. Like, is that, you know, we are like so obsessed with our technology that we're actually not noticing the place. There's a classic one. I don't know if you've heard the story of the Japanese woman that walked off the dock reading her smartphone and drowned, but didn't let go of her cell phone. Like they could pry it out of her dead hands after she drowned. So, so, so little awareness of her surroundings and also socially, right? So it was just like, oh, my head's in my phone, right? And I think that's where many of us are and it's really the root of the problem. Really. Yeah. Um, uh, so in the context of this framework, do you have any opinion on tiny houses? I mean, on tiny houses, yeah. So like that's, uh, um, I, I guess one story I didn't tell is like that most of the world actually lives in tiny houses, right? Like when you get outside of Canada, um, uh, uh, the, one of the first houses in Indonesia that I saw, um, there, there was like eight people living in about the size of my garage. And you know, my, my, my predilection was that, boy, they must be unhappy. And what I couldn't fathom was how happy they were. Um, and like the takeaway message after the first time that I went to Indonesia was like, wow, I was on the sky train in Vancouver looking at all the unhappy faces. And I was like, why are Indonesians so happy with so little? And why are Canadians so unhappy with so much? I think our houses own us. Like, you know, for the most type, for, the, for most people, they're like struggling to pay their mortgage. They have like more house than they need. They have more possessions than they need. They, they've been tricked into this rampant consumerism that you need to buy all this stuff. And that's really the root of where my house building came from. It was like, there's, there's two equations here. Like when you talk about economy, it's like, okay, I need a house. Okay, so I need to make a bunch of money 
so that I can afford a house. But the other way to look at it is um, what can I what can I get to build a house that doesn't cost money? Um, and part of that could be a smaller house. Uh, part of that could be like being creative with uh, cooperative housing or other ways. I lived all summer in an Airstream trailer. And even though my house is small, I realize now I could live in my Airstream trailer. Like really if push came to shove, probably I'd have to get rid of lots of my clothes, but that might be a good thing too, right? I have too many clothes, so. Um, so yeah, that, that it's related to consumerism, really. And if you look at how big the average North American house is, it's obscene, actually. I always wanted to, and you know, I, I kind of like why I called that vignette lost in the technosphere is I wasn't paying attention. I, I think in my own career, I was good at the technology stuff. And so people kept giving me roles in that area. And I think I tell a story, um, in that reading uh, where a student um, said, oh, they thought they thought it was a like a calendar mistake that they'd put my name beside the environmental ed course, which I had worked for five years uh, to create. And I was actually like offended, like, he, like mortally wounded where I realized, oh, this person views me as the tech guy. And like, I don't view myself that way at all. I resigned that position within three months of that time, because I realized this is, I allowed myself to become some person that I don't identify with. I was lost. So then I found myself. And now um, I'm teaching mostly field schools, which I love. Um, and uh, my friend that I was talking to last night, he retired. And he's he's like, wow, my life, I'm just doing all the kinds of things that I like. And I was like, I am too. And I'm not retired. I, I'm I'm teaching the stuff I want to teach. I'm I'm doing field schools. I'm doing this. Um, so I think that I, um, you know, that's always the advice I give young professionals when they're like deciding, well, what should I do? Should I chase the money or should I take this other job that I'm really passionate about? I will say, follow your passion. Like always, like don't chase the money. Just do what you enjoy doing, so. And I think at heart, I'm an ecologist and I'm always going to be. Even when I was a teacher, I was like, oh, I gotta get these kids out of this building. <laughs> it's not allowed, I'll find a way. I'll find a way to trick somebody into saying, even if I have to work with the ministry to make it happen, that's what we'll do, so. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I would like to know, like, in your journey as an environmental educator now for so many years, uh, you find it, like, tough to pitch the idea of home or an interconnectedness with people uh, 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 as a tough part of it. Like, how do you, how do you pitch them this idea and make them realize that the connection is so subtle and important? Well, that's what today was about. I don't think I've done this talk with another group, so I, I don't know if it worked for you, whether it resonates at all, the, this metaphor of home, but um, uh, I think that it's a universal human value, right? And I, I think also on the reverse side, the notion of being homeless is really uh, troublesome too. Like, so, you know, to be on that sort of, darker side of things, if people don't have a home, what is possible for them, right? Like when you think about really how, how much of our success in life, I, I, I have an indigenous student, for example, um, she's a really neat lady, it's an, another story, she's a Haida matriarch, and I've been working in Haida Gwaii for many years, and she was looking at sustainable housing in her village in Skidigit. And she was telling me about the Indian Act. And I, I never really thought about this as deeply as I did in the last few years because I've driven and worked in lots of indigenous communities. And 
one of the first things that you notice is that the houses look like crap and they're in disrepair and you know the more racist people around us would be like saying look at those people they don't look after their houses or whatever it's a poor area blah 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 well she was explaining to me that even though she built her house she doesn't own her house she's a ward of the state she can't get a mortgage against her house she the 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 band owns the property um and so all of the ways that uh, Western people get ahead, like in my own life, I think, well, most of my wealth was created in investing in homes and building. That's not available to them. They, they can't just sell their house and they, they could maybe sell it to another community member, but it's not a, so then I, you know, so, um, there are so many things tied into to this idea of like home ownership and being homeless perhaps as well and the, what what opportunities are taken away in that and then in the developing world you know you have whole other issues with homelessness so so I'm gonna play with this framework quite a bit because I think it's connects to everyone so yeah. Not a comment, but I think um, in the first one that we built, they were talking about that. I don't remember that one that built for you, it was just a building, it's just a house, and they were sort of thinking about, you know, the planet is the biggish thing. We just started thinking about that, that it's not just, you know, the technical aspects of the, the structure that we need, but we really have to focus on ecology and social interactions and all of those things. Um, yeah, because I think the reason why we're struggling so much is we're not equally focused on all those things. So I think it, um, just I guess it's feedback so that any of those sort of work out. Yeah. It's a good metaphor to think through things. Yeah, because I, I think <laughs> what you're saying is that the way we view our homes is kind of the way we view the world, right? Yeah, like you know, Canada's the biggest. Right. So there's like parallels there. Like, how do we think about building this? What was like our, our big home? And what do we focus on? And think about how we have to balance all of those things to the still collectively. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. I'm glad that worked for you. Yeah. Um, in the ecological home you're reading, um, you bring sustained dash ability or sustained dash able. Right. Um, do you mind like kind of expanding on why you chose to write it that way and what that really means to you? Yeah, okay. Well, you know, being an educator, um I've made lots of mistakes, like you know, like trying to be sustainable. Okay, like you know that term sustainable. What what's sustainable? I don't think we know. Um, you know, even the term sustainable, um, I, I, at one point we were doing a publication and I found something like 30 working definitions of the term sustainability, like, you know, depending on whether an economist was writing it or a geographer or whatever. So um, I think that the concept of sustainability is a moving target. And for example, I bought a vehicle, uh, I bought a biodiesel Jeep about 16 or 17 years ago. I'm still driving the thing. Um, and it came with like biodiesel in it, like 15 or 20% biodiesel. And I thought, wow, I'm being green because at the time that was um, really like kind of seen as the thing to do. And that was before palm oil plantation started. And now I was like, oh, I'm embarrassed. I didn't do a good, you know, I didn't do a green thing. I didn't know. Um, so, so that term ability um, sort of relates to sort of um, focusing on the skill aspect of it um, and the thought process rather than like some kind of unattainable un goal of being sustainable. <clears throat> and so when I'm working with teachers and educators, a lot of the the, the early critiques of environmental ed would be like, oh, everyone should recycle, for example, would be an example of sustainability. And I, I would like sarcastically say, oh, so if we 
uh, ramp up production and we consume 10 times more things, but we all recycle, we're good? Is that what you mean? And it's like, oh, no, maybe not, right? So, so, um, so activism, um, like what we're seeing now with the climate strikes and so on, um, rather than the agenda being a teacher's agenda that they're kind of like telling their students what to do, but like actually the teacher thinking of themselves as a coach and saying, okay, if I wanted to make you uh, a better activist, regardless of what that activist would be, how would I teach you? How would I coach you? How would I facilitate that? So that's a really that play on words is that notion of like nurturing ability in students and the sustainable thinking process rather than what's sustainable. I don't, I like, I really don't know what that term means. It changes, right? Did that answer? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'm not sure, maybe we'll talk about this more in the education class tomorrow, but I'm just kind of wondering, like, you mentioned, you know, the importance of um, sort of incorporating values and ethics into education and education practices. How do you sort of do that? Because um, I know there's a big criticism of, oh, well, that's like a soft information kind of thing. But how do you kind of balance that? Or... Right, so that, that would be kind of maybe related to the notion of ecumeny rather than, okay, well, here are some, here are some values and so on that I have, but I'm also like aware that other people have other values and making, making a space for people to talk about their values rather than like kind of pushing it under the rug because really when push comes to shove, really with environmentalism, people rarely act based on their knowledge. They act based on their values, right? And so that to me, when I think of the care framework, which I'll share with the, that class tomorrow, really I think of like Russian dolls. And the last one is the E because that's the one when you don't actually have to teach anymore. If you can impact somebody's environmental values or ethics, um, then, um, like, what's the term I use for ethics? Ethics is what you do when no one's watching, right? It's just what you think is the right thing to do. Um, very, very rarely do people have an environmental ethic. Like, you know, shame, I, we call it shame-based learning, right? Like, if, if you've ever seen, like, in our neighborhood, like your neighbor can cite you if they see garbage in your recycling, for example, or if you don't put your recycling out. And I kind of wonder whether that's that's useful, right? Um, whereas people should be doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm looking at this diagram and in addition with the problems we are having in the world with environmental problems. So what would be the role of the person in the middle in this diagram and being a building contractor in terms of manipulating the um, all the spheres, the vertical sphere, social sphere and oh. so a building contractor in a house building process would be like when I was the contractor, I would say, okay, I'm going to hire you to be my framer and you're going to be, and you're going to just do that and we're going to have a contract. And that would be a subcontractor or it might be the person that does the drywall or the plumbing, right? Um, so that's a construction term. Um, and it's interesting because um, I'm their boss, right? Like in that kind of contractual relationship, but uh, what I found, um, especially when I was building the Bowen house, was that every person that came for the job, like, assumed that I would do things the normal way. Um, and so they would come in and they'd say, oh, well, we have to, that tree's too close to the house. So, um, you know, when, when are we going to take that tree down? And then I would be like, well, actually, we're not going to take that tree down. I like that tree. It's going to stay right where it is. And I'm happy that it's like 
only four feet from the house because I want to look at it out of this window. In fact, we're going to put a window right there so I can look at that tree out of my house. And that was such such a bizarre conversation for most subcontractors. They had actually never talked to a contractor who had an environmental value. In fact, every house that I've seen built in Ontario or any other place, one of the first things that happened is just clear the lot. Start from fresh, like, because I have a drawing that of what I want it to look like. And so we start from there, right? So, it, and I think, you know, whether you're talking about a subcontractor or a teacher or like we all have this kind of bias, perhaps to, related towards one of those spheres or the other. I, w I would find most, <clears throat> most building co subcontractors would not pay any attention to this. They would have a way that they do things and then if they were particularly savvy, they might be good with people, uh, but not a lot, a lot of the time they weren't good with people either. So <laughs> <laughs> they were just like really good at their jobs, right? So uh, I uh, I must have done a fairly, that uh, you just reminded that I had one conflict in Victoria, that first house that I showed, um, we had a very weird um, staircase in that it was a rounded wall. And apparently there's a right way to do that, um, like to create drywall and a rounded wall, and there's a wrong way to do that. And I wasn't even aware that there was a right way because I was a new person doing this. And I had hired this drywall guy, and he said to me, um, he said, well, you know, I think I should do the wall this way. And it was a way of kind of like scoring the back of the drywall so that it would just it was the wrong way to do it. And he said, I think I'm just gonna do it that way. Uh, and he looked at me and he said, the owner will never know. And and I guess he didn't realize that. And, and I just looked at him and I said, well, he does now. <laughs> and, and, and like the guy like freaked out and immediately put a lien on my house because he thought he wasn't gonna get paid. And, and, and because he, he thought, like, I figured out he was trying to cheat me. And, like, we had this, like, huge, um, like, the, the thing actually lasted about two months. And then I finally, I went to his house and I said, you know, I realize you put a lien on my house because you thought I wouldn't pay you. And you know what? Now I can't pay you because you put a lien on my house. And I talked to the bank and I have a lien on my house. I can't get my next I can't get my next draw on the construction, so we're, we have a problem here. Let's talk. And he was like, eventually, we kind of had an understanding. And I said, you know, that wrong way that you were talking about, as long as you don't do that, we're good. I'm happy with a lot of other words. So, anyway, sorry to go on the rant, but <laughs> if everything becomes very personal when you're talking about your house. So. <clears throat> I just want to add, I think you've done a great job. This is a really interesting presentation, very different from what we've been used to. Right. And you're merging two, you know, yeah, two topics that are really uh, difficult to take emotion out of them, which I think is a really good thing. Right. And I think that people can really generally grasp the notion of home and can't always describe exactly what it means to them, but I, yeah, I, I really like that. And you've weaved it together, um, I think, really nicely. Even I would say cleverly done that. Um, Thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. It made me think a lot about um, <clears throat> my own homes over the years. You know, I, I have lived in a PMQ as well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. living in a military household, right? So in, in Montreal. Right. And, 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 many different homes because we were, you know, pretty mobile. And I think about how back then growing up in a household with six people and one washroom and, you know, sharing a bathtub water and like we didn't have a lot and there wasn't a lot of food and um, it was a very different world. And I think about, you know, my son now and the way that I'm raising him and I really sometimes encounter this kind of conflict that you know, we didn't even, I didn't even know it was possible to imagine a household with more than one washroom. 
You know, Christmas gifts weren't wrapped. They were, you know, reusable material that my mother would make. And, you know, I sometimes was jealous of friends who had, you know, these gifts, lavish gifts, and then, you know, rip the wrapping off, and I would think, oh, we put this. Right. <laughs> A beautiful made version of, right? And then, right. A gift wrap. And I, I find that really interesting that we were at times in a way you know i didn't give my parents as much credit for how kind of sustainable you know, right. they, they were about things that we did we never went to disney but we sure you know hiked up every mountain in the country all yeah. you know so so recently I'll, I'll jump to the present i've thought about how can i show my son that i yeah embrace this when i'm teaching this you know yet I'll swim through its importance and, you know, have a coffee out of a cup and I feel bad about that, you know, and I don't want to judge other people and I try to, you know, not judge myself. Um, and so I'm thinking carefully about ways to change that. So I recently put in a deck, but that meant taking out the old one. So I thought, okay, well, we're going to do this work ourselves. Right, so our own, we'll use our own resources, and so my son learned how to actually disassemble the deck. Um, and then my partner and I thought, you know, let's think creatively about now what would we do with this? I have to pay to put it in a landfill, or um, and so we actually had his dad, who's very gifted at 80 and always wanting projects, actually built out of the deck some furniture for our backyard. Oh, that's and it's cool. incredible how many people have come over to our house now and I've said, oh, that's my old deck and it's this furniture that also now has this enormous meaning for me. And my son loves it and so it's this connection, right, that I love my partner and his dad built this furniture and, and it inspired us really to yeah. think more about how can we make reuse materials rather than just something. So it really resonated with me throughout that um, all of these, you know, ways in which they're intertwined and we can get pretty, at times, it, like they get to the core of our being. Yeah. Maybe that's where we start seeing that we will maybe change behavior. It's not by judgment. It's not by preaching. It's not, right? It's yeah. by doing. Oh, cool. I'm glad. And um, I, I was just struck to, to, to share a story with the one bathroom and the PMQ. Um, <laughs> I mean, like how these things are all related too. So we got our house for a song in Chilliwack because it was one of the few houses that still was like kind of in the authentic condition with only one bathroom and no one would buy it. No one would buy it because it only had one bathroom. So we, we got a really good price for it. And I was like, I could put in another bathroom. I could figure out how to do that if we really need one. <clears throat> Ironically, I did that, and now we're not happy with the first bathroom, so I have to, that's my project for later. So. <laughs> but I enjoy that, and my wife, my wife came uh, in the bathroom that we built downstairs. She came home one day, and she said, what are you doing this professorship for? You should just be like a professional tiler. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There is something to be said about doing it with your own hands in your home. Yeah. Like I have an incredible sense of like, I guess it's like craftsmanship of like, you know, when you walk into a bathroom that you did yourself, it's, yeah. it's a cool feeling. So, yeah. Okay. Well, oh, there's one more question. Yeah. Um, so I don't really know how to conceptualize this thought, but I know a lot of people think technology is the answer to all these sustainable you know, challenges we're facing right now, but there's also a lot to be said about going back to the way things were. And it seems like only a few generations ago, things were a lot more sustainable, just by out of necessity and lifestyle. So do you see the path forward being in the technosphere, in innovation, and all these different technologies, or is it more about just going back to work um, well for me and I don't pretend to be the but I I think historically I probably was in the technology camp I thought oh well like we could solve this but I think increasingly 
I'm more that this is a cultural change that is required and often the technology without the cultural change like I think technology is not all bad like you know some things like LED lighting and other things are like you know demonstrably better uh, but if it's if it's done with this same throwaway culture um, you know it's not helping right so um, so I, I, I'm a, I'm in the cultural camp. I think cultural change is needed, um, and the technology is not going to solve it alone. Yeah. Can I have one comment? Just that our election results. I think your framework helps to understand conflicts we're having in Canada, and it's really conflicts between these spheres and more specific mm -hmm. between that community ecology and economy. Yeah. And it's quite, you know, it's geographic in some cases, and in some cases it's, it's, it's cultural in the same place. But, yeah, I think it's a good framework to anal analytically look at uh, our, our world and, and from a transdisciplinary perspective, which is part of the center's focus, is, this is a nice framework to bring some of that transdisciplinary thinking that we need to move forward. So, I like that. Well, I'll keep playing with the framework. Yeah. I think it graphically needs to be represented a different way. I'm, 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 I'm going to have to hire a good graphic artist, or I'm going to have to learn to become a graphic, a better graphic artist. So, you can contract. Yeah. <laughs> subcontract that. Yeah. And I like to make other jokes too. Like, I'm really a constructivist teacher because I've you know, had several constructions. <laughs> Any constructive comments? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm I'm not as good I'm not as good I'm not as good as good as at deconstructing things, but I'm really good at constructing things. <laughs> well, on that note, we thank you very much for your great talk. Thank yeah, you. My pleasure.